be into short size, so we are going to be standing on this chair so we can see everybody. <laughs> I hope you're grateful, and if, if you fall off, uh, you will be part of the suit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so excited tonight to be able to speak with my friend and colleague, Christina, and with Tariq, who is an eyewitness to the issues that we're talking about tonight. If we turn on the TV, or if we go to our favorite news site, it seems like every week, or sometimes even every day, we see something about the Syrian refugee crisis. And we often hear people saying things about it. For example, Prince Charles, the one from England, not Prince William, the older one, the one without the hair. Prince Charles, uh, for example, said that climate change is the root cause of the Syrian war. But then someone immediately said, no, Prince Charles should steer clear. This is a rhetorical claim that has no basis in reality. Another news source said, no, for the last time, the Syrian crisis was not caused by climate change. Who's right? I'll give you a hint to what we're going to say tonight. And the hint is, neither of them. And here's why. Let's put the pieces together from a climate perspective. So if you look at the Middle East, a large part of the Middle East is what we call arid or semi-arid region with a very high potential for water stress. The red the color, the greater the risk of water stress just because of the geography and the resources and the places where they live. Now we're going to be looking at a lot of maps of this area. So right now, you want to see where Syria is. Syria is, my hand doesn't reach that far. Syria is basically almost in the middle. And as you can see, much of Syria is red, and then the rest of it is orange. So Syria is already at risk for water stress, just like if you look at the United States, just like we are. I managed to find these two maps that were made by the same people with the same colors. Isn't that cool? So where we live in West Texas, which I'm sure we can find a map, is the same color as half of Syria. So that helps us understand better what type of situation they live in. They have the same risks of water stress and shortages that we confront every day here. And if you look at the local news here in Texas, it's rare to go a week, and certainly even less than a week, it's rare to go a week without some mention of our water issues. Especially since we know that the nice El Nino that we're in right now is ending, and we have a good chance of being in another La Nina soon the next year. And we all know what the last one looked like, 2011 is bad. So what has been happening in Syria? Well, from 20, 2006, to 2011, up to 60% of Syria, and we have this handy black arrow here so you can see Syria, up to 60% of Syria experienced one of the worst long-term droughts in modern history. This is a map from Landsat satellite imagery showing in 2003 the irrigated and rain-fed wheat fields looking very healthy over Syria. That's on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side in 2009, this is what the exact same place looked like. There was no rain-fed fields left. The only fields left were irrigated fields. But in Syria, according to my understanding, and to we can confirm this if it's true, in Syria you need a government permit to dig a well. But you only get a government permit if you've produced the right prong, so to speak. So many people were in situations where they were not allowed to dig wells. So either they had to try to do so legally, or else they couldn't and they had no access to water. By 2008, a quarter of a million farmers had already abandoned their land. This red area shows the agricultural abandonment hotspot. In other words, places where numbers of farmers were just abandoning their land, moving to the city. 
brilliant. Well, if you check your face, it turns out that more people keep a bit of the arms, the longer the breath lasts. So you have to look at updated numbers. So where does climate change come in? Well, in 2011, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, published a study showing that drought risk in the Mediterranean area, and again, remember the Syria fronts onto the Mediterranean, after Syria's Mediterranean coastline. Drought in the Mediterranean was becoming more frequent as a result of a changing climate. Red here is drought, green is normal, white. Then there was this paper that was published just this past uh, year. It was published two months ago. And this paper, I'm going to read to the print because I don't expect you to read it. This paper found that, first of all, the drought did contribute to conflict in Syria, number one. And it also found that this drought was two to three times more likely now than it would have been a hundred years ago with no climate change. So in other words, if rolling a double six is this drought, what climate change has been doing is taking off a few more of those numbers. So your chances of rolling a double six are now bigger than they would have been 50 or 100 years ago. This paper went on to explain that natural variability alone cannot account for the trends in wind and rain and heat. Sounds like a lot of this <laughs> Wind and rain and heat have led to this massive drought. All of these factors, together with what? Together with other things, contributed to tip Syria into the situation that it's in today. So what do we have here? We have a drought-prone region that is already at risk from water stress, Syria and West Texas. But then to that, you add the fact that there's widespread corruption, they don't have crop insurance. <laughs> they don't have pivot irrigation in many places. And then you have a very rapidly growing population with ethnic tensions. What does that add up to? It adds up to a very overloaded camel. And then along comes the final straw. And what did the final straw do to the camel? It broke its back. And now I'm going to hand it over to Problems, 
when the cat said is the last straw. You have a tension, a big tension in the country, right? And then you have this prolonged drop because of the climate change. So the result is, you know, a big conflict with lots of people actually uh, leaving the country and so on. And here, I have a, I just took this from an article showing that the timeline of events, you know, summarizing what happened to Syria and how it ended up with this huge problem, uh, you know, refugee problem. Now, as we said in our title, this is just a tip of the iceberg, right? So we look to this situation. This is we oh, don't expect that this will be an isolated situation. Because what climate change will do to the, you know, our habitat is it will affect our agriculture and it will affect the sea level. Now this is a picture showing what will happen with our agriculture as you know the temperature is rising and which regions of the world will be mostly affected. And if you look to this map, Africa will be one of the most affected regions. And as we all know, Africa, most of the countries in Africa are actually very poor. They are uh, agricultural dependent. They actually have much lower level of living in land than Syria has. It's about five percent in countries in Africa. Also, they have continuous conflicts. There are different ethnic groups, and historically, they have problems. So when you look to all these, you know, issues, and you add the fact that agriculture very much affected by climate change. It's reasonable to expect that, that something similar will happen in the future, especially in this very poor region of Africa. Now, another issue that is related to, to climate change and it will affect conflict and it will affect migration is actually the sea level rise. And when we look to the human populations in the world, of human populations are close, deep close to the, to the sea on the coastal area. And that makes sense because you know, we all want to have a source of water. Well, not in our But generally speaking, most of the communities want to be close to that natural source of water. However, what will happen is that with a sea level rise, and that's a picture showing where are these communities and how large they are. So what will happen with the sea level rise is that, first of all, the, the, the sea water will be infiltrating actually the clean uh, water resources. So that will be initially access to clean water resources. And in some cases, and we have to talk about that, they will basically destroy food for the existing nothing. We do nothing about that. So, uh, you have put together this, this map showing what are the regions that will be most, will be most affected by climate change and that have the highest, the highest risk of producing refugee, climate refugees. And keep in mind that some of these regions will be affected by climate change because of the drought and people will leave the land because they no longer have enough food. But some regions, for example, Bangladesh, will be affected by the sea level rise. They already have problems with the, with the flooding, and the sea level rise will actually make these problems even worse. Now, so talking, summarizing this problem of climate change and migration, in social sciences, we have this general problem of causation. How do you establish that one variable, one event, actually produces, let's say, a migration of people in this case, or some other changes in the society? The problem is that we never have this simple relationship. There are always other factors that influence that. However, we know what are the things or what is the, the mix of things that have the highest probability of producing the events of this migration. So we can summarize you know, when you look to migration, when people migrate, generally speaking. They might migrate because they want a better life, right? If they have the right connections, they will move to that place where they, they have you know, social capital, where they can 
the United States. Now, another key that is specific to West Texas is that it doesn't have a little piece of migration. Actually, we have a high rate of migration. People are living in this area. We are very special with this Texas because we use population rather than we see population. Now, this is good and it's bad. It's bad because what we have, we have an aging population and we have fewer people who are born in age. And if something happens with our water resources, if the agriculture is no longer in the same level as it is today, then we'll, this problem of aging will actually be more and more serious. Now, yeah. And they're not alone. When we look around the world, 
It's too polluted. They're getting ready to give up their entire plant. Their island will be underwater. New Zealand is giving 75 people a work permit every year. But that's not fast enough for everybody to go back This is a report called In Search of Shelter, Mapping the Effects of Climate Change on Human Migration and Displacement. And in this report, they said two important things that I wanted to focus on. First of all, it emphasizes how those who are already most at risk today from poverty, hunger, water shortages, basic health issues, those are the very people who will be most affected not just affected, but devastated by a changing climate because they lack the safety net that we are so fortunate to have. <coughs> and so this report went on to say something that I think we all need to take to heart, and that is the fact that from a humanitarian perspective, it's critical to address climate change and to invest in building our resilience so that fewer people are forced to migrate. I want to end with some words that do not come from a scientific report. Words that I have thought of a lot over the past year when I see pictures of people being forced from their homes. And these are the words of Jesus who said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger to you. But you invited me in. And then the people said, but when did we see you hungry? Or when did we see you thirsty? And it says, Whoever, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. So at this point, we have a choice. We know that things are getting worse. We know that they are going to impact the people who already lack basic necessities of life. This is the point at which we as a society can make choices to invest in their futures so that they can, as Christina said, stay where they want to be. Because everybody would rather just do it. They live somewhere on the other side of the world. And if we can do that, then we can move into the future together in a way that gives us all that hope that we need. Rather than a world where everybody is guarding their borders against these strangers who are desperate. And the north 
and to the east of Syria, you have mountains, forests, rivers. You, if you go there, you realize you probably are in Europe, not in, in the Mediterranean, not in the Middle East. So it's a very beautiful country. We have many uh, climates, we have many uh, landscapes. With the drought, it changed the geography distribution. So uh, many areas were suffering from losing of vegetation cover and agricultural land forced the people to move to the cities where they can live. Uh, the main reasons for the drought, not only the climate change, but also the corruption of the government, that was a major uh, contributor to the crisis, uh, to the drought crisis in Syria. The government in general, they have laws, they have uh, regulations, but it's not followed because easily you can just get money under the table to the officer and he can give you the net or whatever you want to do. So I don't dig that up uh, well. You want to build an agricultural area. In theory, you can't do everything. On paper, it's, it's not allowed. It's permitted, but under the table, you can do whatever you want. So that caused many uh, rivers and many rivers to reduce in their capacity, like Guadalajara in Damascus, a very famous river. Many springs that that's feeding that river actually dried out. Uh, many uh, green areas are becoming brown, becoming deserts. Uh, with all these consequences, and when the Syrian pollution started in Syria in 2011, this drought actually gave the regime the best environment to create enemies. So uh, the drought in the north eastern part of Syria, the increasing drought, the increasing severe environment, left low population. Uh, most of the population, they uh, fled that drought to the cities to find education, to find better life, and left the area in some sort of ignorance. No high level of education, uh, very deserted and remote areas, no, no established transportation system, no infrastructure, so those areas became deserted in the sky. And when the Syrian revolution started, the regime just uh, released all the criminals, not the political uh, prisoners, released all the criminals and put them in that area, knowing that it would be a nuclear for a much greater enemy, which we see now uh, terrorism and ISIS, caused by ISIS in that area. So the drought was the main reason why ISIS actually became stronger. It was the best environment for a terrorist group to grow. You have people with low education, with low education. Uh, you have remote area, nobody can go there. So it was the best environment. And beside that, the regime never attacked those area and attacking all the other agricultural areas, throwing barrel months of them. And those federal bonds actually removed a lot of the agricultural areas. Mainly, uh, I don't know if you read about the International Center for Agricultural Research, right areas in Carta. They used to have really huge areas of wheat and barley and agricultural experiments. They were so uh, active and they had a lot of <coughs> agricultural uh, activities and research there. And the regime just wiped them out, so they had to move all their work from Aleppo in Syria to Jordan, in Amman to Jordan. So this all changed the whole uh, the whole situation. So this created more drought, more desert areas. Uh, you don't have this agricultural land as it used to be, and that was part of the regime to kill. Uh, to kill the country because their, their global was either a soft or you burn down the country. I don't want to make this political talk, but just because it contributed significantly to the drought in Syria. It wasn't just uh, a single act or uh, arbitrary factors, it was planned, act, and it forced people to leave their, their homes and move to Jordan and Lebanon. And Jordan is. Uh, uh, we came to the south of Syria. It's smaller than Syria, and it's uh, the top ten 
the countries that that are forced in water resources. And they have refugees coming from the Syria of two million refugees that increased the water demand in the government of the country itself. So that created a crisis for Jordan. They already have a water shortage and now they have two million people to, to give uh, water to. So the whole situation is uh, related to climate change somehow. Some people will say it's, it's a cause of climate change, the drought caused this. It's all synchronized issue. One thing will lead to another. And when you have uh, corruption and bad politics, it will definitely uh, affect the environment. And that's what happened in Syria. <coughs> uh, as I said, now it's becoming more and more and more uh, drought. And I think for the, the situation since 2001 until now actually helped in increasing the speed of the process. Instead of taking probably 10 years or 20 years, I think it will take just probably three or four more years until we see severe drops. That's if Syria became stable again. That will, then we will see the actual effect that will actually happen there. So uh, it's not getting better, the drought is getting worse, and climate change and the human factor are definitely playing a major role in what's happening in Syria and exporting the issues to other countries as well.
a Muslim faith, and the majority of Syria are Sunni Muslims. So when the leader became Alawi, that, and he took control, and he took power, that would make all the Muslim Alawis who used to live in the villages and the countryside to move to the cities and have, uh, they abandoned their agricultural lands and they moved to the cities and they start to have their own way, new way of life. Uh, also, this to create a more divided sectorial part here because divide to concur basically. So the regime want this sectorial division to be more obvious. So that created corruption. So you'll see only Alawites are taking important rules of the government and taking major rules in, uh, as being major officers. So uh, creating a corruption and rule for you, for you can pay people at the table without caring who can be punished because you're related to the president or to the royal family, let's say. So that's how we're creating a whole uh, corruption environment that many people uh, just try to ha have to pay money under the table to the wills and excessive use of water and nobody is getting punished and the uh, powerful people having their farms and use the spring water to feed their farms and leaving the rivers to dry out. So the security of the plays the major rule by forcing all the uh, uh, part of the uh, country sexual uh, phase to move to the cities and build their their own lifestyle. Uh, I am Hassan, I'm also from Syria, and I live in the studios of the Syrian Revolution. So, uh, if you might like to look at a self criticism in the country, there is uh, some culture of corruption that was spread among people. So the government recently issued some laws to stop digging wells, okay? Um, people wanted to dig wells even though they weren't educated that this is dangerous, we have like problem with water resources. So even people wanted like, okay, I don't care about this, I will just go bribe someone and get the well dig. So uh, if they will even look, if this government official wasn't brought, they will look at someone else. And unfortunately, historians said this culture was spread by the Iranian. Now, historically, the green areas in Syria are controlled by Alawites. So, the most beautiful areas, the mountains, the rich, cold water, are controlled by, by the Alawites. Well, of course, the Saad regime is very bad, but the guys who are fighting the Saad are not bad good too. A lot of them are terrorists, and they, they are despised by the ethnic things, so not all of them are called ISIS. So, they also want these areas, so they would say, we'll kick them out and like, let them in the city and occupy the areas. So it's not really very complicated, just I wanted to have that.
Thanks a lot.